Good morning, everyone. This is Jim Shaw. I'm uh, Director of Sales and Marketing at, at DTS and want to thank all of you for joining us today as we continue our webinar series to inform and educate uh, both our customers and, and our partners. Today, we're going to cover a variety of ruggedized accessories that we've developed over the years for high shock occupant safety testing. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to cover the format and a few logistics. The webinar will be a slide presentation and audio from the presenter only, so please check your audio and video settings. As an attendee, you'll be muted. However, we do encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation by typing them into the Q&A window. Uh, we have a panel of our experts monitoring and answering questions throughout the event, and we'll try to answer as many as we can along the way. If you have additional questions or specific topics that you'd like to cover offline, please just reach out to us directly and coordinate with our sales team. Uh, this session will be recorded and made available on our video library page, on our website, and also on our YouTube channel. Your presenter today is Chad Ivan. Chad is our sales and applications manager out of our Michigan office. Uh, with him as panelists online today are Nate Brown, who also works out of Michigan. He's a senior application engineer. And uh, Kyvery Henderson, who's a system application engineer, is online as well from our headquarters in Seal Beach, California. So with that, I will hand it over to Chad and uh, enjoy the webinar. All right. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate the introduction and uh, thank you to the panelists for them uh, taking on the task of answering everybody's questions. Um, I wanted to start out with this webinar to first talk about our help center. Our help center, if you have not checked it out yet, is a great place for getting additional information, even on some of the products that are now obsolete. If you have any questions, it's free to sign up. I highly recommend that if you have not, make sure you get yourself an account on our help center and uh, type in the search function and you should be able to find information on a lot of different topics there. So our agenda for today is to discuss ruggedized accessories. I'm gonna go through a historical perspective of items that we, you may or may not know that we've actually developed in the past. Um, talk about classifications of some of these products and also current offerings that we have today and then ideally, we want to get to the point where we're making sure that we're developing products that meet your future application needs. So I want to talk a little bit about some future products that we're considering developing. Um, and we will wrap back up with talking about the Help Center again and how you can give your input on things that we need uh, to develop to support this industry. So I'm going to utilize this little logo here, DTS Crashworthy. That logo is basically going to be on slides where the product is actually currently available. So there are a lot of things that I'm going to show you just to show you the depth and broadness of everything that we've developed in the past. But anything with Crashworthy on it is a product that you can currently order um, today. So ruggedized accessories. What do we have? What is a ruggedized accessory? It's a product that helps integrate different solutions um, in particular high level acceleration tests. Um, things like vehicle crash tests. So I'll get a little photo there from uh, safe cars. Crash tests, blast tests would be one type of test. Um, different types of aerospace events. So we've had our systems actually launch into the outer space and, and come back to Earth. And uh, if you guys don't recognize this, this is actually um, a development that just recently touched down on Mars. So we were involved in some of the testing when it comes to some of the Mars uh, hardware. Um, we're going to actually start a poll because in order for me to help tailor this a little bit more to your particular needs. I'm gonna see if I can kick off the poll here to ask you guys what it is that, what, what particular industry you guys are at. So hopefully the poll has launched. It says launch polling. Um, and I'm waiting to see, there we go.
Um, looking to see where we sit as far as aerospace, automotive, biomechanics, industrial, or military and defense, or, or other is a, another one of your options there. So if you don't mind, take a couple seconds here to go ahead and click the button to let me know where you guys, uh, what different industries you guys work in. So neck and neck at the moment between automotive and aerospace. It's kind of fun. I get to see the I actually get to see the data live. No one else can. Aerospace is now in the lead. Apparently, the automotive guys have everything they need already. So that's a good thing. A couple more aerospace guys popping in. We've got a couple of biomechanics, a few military people. So we've got 34, we've got 70% of people have voted. If you don't mind, click on the button. I'll give you 10 more seconds here. And I believe this poll ends up showing up to you guys uh, after we're done. So 14 people uh, are aerospace. We've got 10 people automotive, three people in injury biomechanics, nobody in industrial space, uh, military five and four for other. So, so I can go ahead and share the results there. I believe you guys can see that. So I appreciate everybody's time there to take the poll. So we've got quite a few aerospace guys. All right, let's get back to the presentation here. Get that out of the way. So capability to run, we, we have the capability to develop and also test a lot of different types of, different types of devices that we actually will develop. So that includes temperature and humidity, which is typically pretty important for our aerospace people, making sure that we can handle some of the higher temperatures or lower temperatures. Um, of course, most of our electronics, we'd like to keep it out, outside of the uh, um, uh, condensing type of humidity, but we do have the ability to test a large temperature range and also a large humidity range. We also do a lot of testing with ESD or high pot type of testing where we'll shock the devices to make sure they can handle whether it's a, a a low, low lightning strike or at a minimum helping with ESD protection for our equipment. We can also do high acceleration. So we have a device that can do up to 20,000 Gs uh, acceleration to be able to make sure that our some of our products, not all of our products, but some of our products are rated to be up to that level. And then we have a drop tower that typically is used for things that are a little bit heavier mass and we can do a thousand Gs on that one with no issue at all. So how do we classify the different devices, these accessories? We have power interface devices, we have system interfaces, and we also have some specialty items that I'll share with you today. Um, we have built and developed a lot of different visual status indicators. Some of these guys, basically I've got dates on them because they've come through at different times um, in the, the product life cycle. But this one in particular actually has an event tape switch on it. It has a control port and it has a power input port. And we actually had used two different LEDs to be able to tell whether the system was ready or whether the test system had faulted. Um, one of the things that DTS has taken a lot of time and pride in is ensuring that these ports have become basically standard. So as I go through the different product line, you will see the names of the ports and the functions of the ports being the same. So here's an example of a control port. A control port always has these particular pins. A power port has these particular pins. Depending on the voltages for the power port, we may end up changing the keying or it may be a slightly different style connector, but we try to make sure that all products basically within our family fit together and operate together. So event trigger input is a 0B, or that's actually a 1B LIMO, um, but the pinout would be exactly the same. So we have one that we also developed in 2007 for a different customer. I believe this customer was out of Japan who wanted a device that would allow them to be able to distribute time zero along with having its own separate battery and also utilizing a different style LED. This one actually had two sets of LEDs behind the single reflector. And that was in 2007. 2009, it was taken to another level where we actually had put in, I believe this was in England, 
um, a, a customer wanted two COM ports, and the COM port is a port where you can daisy chain our devices together. So that has triggers, events, status lines, and also Ethernet. So we had developed another version. And we have something that this also was a, a request from a customer in Japan was to have a strobe light. The strobe light is something that you were able to actually put in the view of a video. And at time zero, the light would flash, just like a, a other types of strobes. But this one was intended for onboard use. And it's currently available. And it is compatible with Slice Pro TDMs and also a visual status indicator from 2009, that particular version. So I have a quick little video here to show you guys the operation. Down here is a little input for the event time zero. And you'll see one of those visual status indicator boxes. And basically, oh, a nice little red flash there. I'll play this a couple times. That time it didn't actually show up on mine. So, oops, I got to go back one screen, sorry. Um, let's see. Not sure how good it comes through on the webinar, but figure play it a few times. You should be able to see the bright red flash. Very short event, uh, but intended for marking a time zero event, whether it's uh, you know it's, uh, um, separation of two different parts of a of an aircraft, or if it's the vehicle hitting the wall. Then we had a military. Um, client who had requested this particular unit. It was a status reporting unit, still in the same lines of visual status indication type of boxes. Uh, this guy actually has a three color code LED for it behind a single reflector. It was also requested that it was able to be activated and turned on from a remote distance. So the blue ethernet cable that you see there actually goes to this remote um, status interface box, and you can use the on off button there. And you're also able to put in a start record into the system so that all of your DAS will be synchronized and, and recording before any type of uh, major blast event would happen. And this guy here, the visual status indicator lamp plus is actually one of our DTS crash worthy products that is available today. So this is another version, it only has two color codes, a red and a green. And it works with what we now call the aux port that is on our Slice Pro TDM units. And I'll have a little bit more on that a little bit later. But this is one of those visual status indication devices that is available today. So now we get into some of our power conversion devices or power, whether it's backup or power conversion devices. So Long time ago, this is actually part of our TDAS uh, family, which came out in 1996, I believe, 1995. Um, so 12 volt battery pack, multiple in and out connections. So that is the same power connector that's used with all of our devices that are in the 12 to 15 volt input range. Uh, and it was rugged. It was able to go on either in, in any type of vehicle um, for occupant safety testing. A little bit later on, we developed, we started getting into some lithium uh, polymer battery packs. Uh, this lithium battery pack was, of course, smaller, uh, pretty good power density, has an on off switch uh, to be able to turn on the power to the external devices, had a very wide input range, 18 to 36 volts DC input range, lots of different power output connections. And you'll notice there an amphenol connector is being used because it's a, a higher current and also a higher voltage range. Um, and of course, another amphenol for the power out going to other devices. And it did have a COM port on it, so it could be included as part of the chain and also have the ability to decide whether the battery was low and actually pull that status line. That is a unique feature that within our equipment is that any device that's on a COM line actually has the ability to report a fault to everybody else that's on that COM line. And then there's also a control link, which is another one of our standardized bus structures. Status LEDs, and this device actually has a web server built into it uh, for software connectivity. So you're able to talk to it and find out what the batteries are doing and had a maximum of 220 watt power output. There was a larger version of this called the smart battery, 
course, we just looked at the mini smart battery. This would be the, the larger version. This one did not have the COM port, or it did not have the control port, sorry. It does have two COM ports, though, so you're able to daisy chain this into the other devices that are inside of your data acquisition network. Um, same very wide input range. And since this had even more current capability, it was even a larger Amphenol connector that was added. Similar status LEDs and also a web server was built into this guy. We had a crash thing called the crash battery, which was a much smaller device, um, still based on lithium polymer battery technology, had an on off switch, a much tighter voltage input range, did have some different outputs available for it. Um, and it had a COM connection and also a slice connection. Has status LEDs and had a maximum of 250 watts power available on it. But now that brings us to the, the DTS crashworthy product that is now available. So we now have another lithium polymer battery pack. This guy basically takes some of the best attributes from the mini smart battery, smart battery, and also the crash battery and combines them together. So we have an on off switch for having the ability to turn the device on and off, the same wide input range, multiple power output connections and daisy chain capability is all included in on this along with status LEDs for the capacity of the battery and also whether the outputs are actually turned on or off. And this one likewise has a web server for software connectivity. So you're able to check out temperatures and, and battery voltages has a total capacity of 450 watts. So it's more than just a battery. This is actually a power conversion device also. And it has about 180 watts that are available on its uh, battery backup power, but that is available today. And something else that uh, kind of gets overlooked every once in a while is we do have waterproof uh, data acquisition systems, but in the effort to try to limit the number of products that we actually have to develop, this is the IP68 power pack that allows you to bolt any, any type of very small data acquisition to it, whether it's the nano or the micro or the IP68. Um, we try to look for opportunities to, to make these devices not super, super specific for one particular application. We want to make sure that we're letting people use it for many different devices. So that is also available today. So in the past, we had some stuff like, this was a crash-worthy power supply. Um, it was an on, for onboard power conversion. We had a client who wanted to be able to do AC out to their vehicle so you can travel long distances with low current and um, also then have the output, the 15 volt output, 13.8 to 15 volt output for uh, devices that were inside of this vehicle. Uh, it, is, it was crash rugged and ready to go. Today, we have a blast power conversion box that we've been building. Um, this guy basically has a DC to DC converter in it. There are multiple options that are available for it, but this particular one was 18 to 36 volt DC input power and 15 volt output power. Very ruggedized case and, case. and also um, one of the things that we've tried to do to work with our customer, they, they had some issues with bending some of the plates um, because of deformation that was happening in this particular vehicle in the, in the one zone that they were trying to install stuff. So we had done some deformable mounting brackets here with holes punched in them so that if the structure of the vehicle happens to bend, at least the device on the top is uh, not going to get damaged. So that is a device that's available today. And we do have a couple different configurations, whether it's got two outputs or six different outputs and different input voltage ranges also. It's fairly flexible. So now we're getting into a little bit more advanced devices here with the uh, distributor. So in the past, we've sold several different versions of the dis these distributors having 36 to 60 volt DC input power or 18 to 36 or even AC input power um, nine different outputs for DC or for DC to power the TDAS slash slice uh, hardware line. Um, two COM ports again for daisy chaining, an umbilical port, auxiliary ports, event inputs, and event output. So that would be the time zero markers. And also having internal batteries in some of the different devices. 
lots of lots of capability packed in a very rugged, very uh, it was a fairly large box, but nice product line. Um, then we had the system distributor, which was a slightly smaller box, still having a lot of different device functions. Um, this one actually incorporated some special things that were a little bit outside of our norm with some imager power control and event ports. So one of the things that we've done is work with customers in order to make sure that anything that plugs into our particular system or through our system, managing different types of triggers, whether they're RS-485 triggers or, or high going low triggers or low going high triggers. Um, we have lots of different electronics and of course a lot of different background in being able to develop these products so that they will work well with other people's equipment also. So they can all seamlessly integrate into one nice uh, one nice system inside of your, or for your test. So I'm not gonna read all those things. It's got lots of different devices, lots of different items on it. Um, then of course, for some other clients, we needed a smaller version, a mini distributor. This is actually a very similar size to the Power Pro unit um, so that they fit nicely together. This has also lots of different options were available, um, but the system port is a newer type of port for us where power, ethernet, status, and trigger are all incorporated on one particular connection. And it's used predominantly for our end of chain type of devices like a slice six crash test dummy um, or th those types of applications where you don't have a, the ability to come back with a second or you don't wanna come back with a second cable. And this guy has umbilic the umbilical port and also the control port for being able to communicate with some of those other devices. And inside of there was a uh, intern, there's a capacitor. And this of course is still available today. Um, there's a capacitor to back up trigger lines and to make sure that status and stuff continues to get passed if there's a power interruption at the uh, high dynamic event time. Here's another product. Um, this we're starting to get into a little, a couple of these more uh, obscure products. I would say we had a client that had asked us to make an enclosure for a custom enclosure for the Intrepid NeoVi Fire 2 um, can logger. So we have some electronics inside of this particular box that help make it synchronize um, triggers and events with our outside world since DTS, uh, the DTS infrastructure is used at these different facilities. Um, so it does have a COM port and it does have a standardized power port from us, but it also added the ports for the CAN and LIN um, communication and of course digital in and digital out, which were all being handled by the Intrepid device that is available today also. Um, Lots and lots of different sensor breakout boxes we've built in the past, uh, many unique um, devices. This is just a couple here, a uh, breakout box for being able to check the different gauges on a sensor itself, um, or being able to you know, run, break, uh, break out or put this in between to see what happens when you lose one arm of a, uh, of a bridge, um, or if you're not able to communicate with a Dell SID as an example. So we make lots of those different things too. Trigger distribution is something that tends to be fairly popular. Um, this box here has COM A and COM B on it. So it can be daisy chained in multiple time zero outputs. We do have a newer version of this that I'll show you in a minute. Um, event, um, there's the event dual binding post there at the end where you use banana jacks to be able to plug in uh, tape switches or other devices to be able to give us that time zero marker in, and of course, power in an event. And that event is the same one that you saw on some of the other devices um, before. Trigger interface. Um, this is another nice little rugged device that we had built up that allows the, basically there's a pass through in here. So there's an up connector and there's a com connector, which is basically our down connector. Um, you can put this in line and be able to put in a time zero. So there's LEDs and a status um, DTS, whenever everything is armed and ready to go, that status line goes high. So that little light would come on and it gave you a button, a nice heavy duty button to be able to uh, push to be able to again, mark that start record signal uh, to all the different devices and also be able to plug in an external status LED if you wanted to. 
which would go back to something similar to the VSI. So here is our product that is now currently available for trigger distribution. So this is a Slice Pro TDM. It can actually go on a Slice chain, a Slice Pro chain. Um, it can actually be added as the fifth device on a Slice Pro TDM or a Slice, Slice Pro chain. And it can also be used independently without any other ECMs or USB interfaces uh, along with it. So it has a couple nice things. It's a switch closure for the um, trigger inputs. It has configurable outputs. So there are six configurable outputs. Those things can be set up as normally open, normally closed. They can be TTL high or TTL low. And that is all done through jumpering a pin on that same connector. So the, the cable actually determines the function of that particular output. And we have power if you're going to run this uh, not as part of a chain. And you also have the aux connector. And if the aux connector has been set up properly, you can use that visual status uh, lamp uh, in order to find out outside of the particular test environment whether the, the unit is still good to go or not. It has a built-in battery. And it has a built-in battery. And it's available today. Slice Pro, I don't know, some people may not have heard of this before, but the Slice Pro timed output module, we call it a TOM. This is for firing airbags or other types of ordnance. Um, it has four configurable output channels here at the top. So those are 2B LIMO 305s. You can set them up as constant current, or you can do a capacitive discharge to deploy or to fire a squib. Um, it's always got delta timing after time zero. So the fastest you can fire it is at what we would call time zero, or you can do 0.1 millisecond time, uh, set it up at any increment, 0.1 millisecond after that, uh, out through, it's got a, a very large uh, counter range. Um, it records both the voltage and the current for every one of those outputs. So it's a four channel output device, but it actually has eight data channels that it can record at the same rate as everything else that would be in the Slice Pro chain. Uh, it has digital output channels that are also available that can be timed in a similar fashion if you connect in a connector to this guy down here. So the digital out. And there's also an arm safe switch that makes sure that when that switch is disabled, meaning you're not allowed to fire, we actually ensure that there's a, a, a bridge across the two output lines to make sure that there's no possibility that the, the squib would deploy. Uh, once you enable that, then we pull, the, pull that shunting bar out of the system. Uh, status LEDs, and of course, it has a built-in battery out today also, and it's available today. Slice Pro Dim is a device that allows you to record 18 digital input channels. So a digital input channel would be something like a switch, just, it's just a switch closure. So you could put one piece of foil on one particular device, one particular uh, component and another piece of foil on another component. And when those two pieces of foil come together, you would end up with uh, going from a zero to a one saying that that's when that actual time of uh, connection occurred. So a lot of people use it for even separations. You can have it where as it separates, it goes from a one to a zero. So as two devices are coming apart, um, makes it really simple to, to record things that don't have a lot of different bits that they need. It's only a one or a zero. And it can be ordered with one B limos or zero B limos if you wanted to make sure that the, uh, they couldn't be confused with a normal sensor input module. And that is available today. Something else that's available today, and this goes to more of our uh, military slash aerospace guys. Um, this is a shock isolation mount that we produce. It basically gives you another layer of shock protection on top of the typical shock protection that's already built into all of the devices that we sell. Um, you're able to mount a Slice Pro system inside of there. I'm pretty sure that even if you had a G5, a G5 system would fit with a different mounting plate, or you can fit a pair of a mini distributor and also a Power Pro inside of this, uh, this box. It's intended for, its original intention or its design was for underbody blast testing. 
So we utilize some motion to be able to lower the acceleration rate. We allow the system to move a tiny bit on that orange plate. And of course there's a tie off for all of the, the wires. That's what the extra gold thing is on the top is to be able to tie down. And, and then there's a shield to protect the wiring and also the, um, the DAS from anything that could be happening within the vehicle at that time of that blast. And that's available today. So another new product, this is a brand new product that we're getting ready to launch. It's almost available today and I'm gonna say it's available today, but uh, we have a new tilt sensor that's available. It's a rugged tilt sensor. It can go any place that any other uh, one of our units can go. It has a similar profile and mounting to other tilt sensors that are on the market. Some unique features though are that ours is actually chainable. So you're able to plug in one to the next and also use extension cables to go between different, whether it's body segments inside of a crash test dummy, or if you're looking to measure, and this is only to measure, it doesn't record during the event, but you're looking to measure the particular angles of devices prior to uh, a high dynamic event, but it can handle high dynamic events and it can be reused time and time again. Um, we have the I squared C sensor USB interface, which allows you to either plug it directly into your computer and be able to monitor those, uh, those tilt angles, or you can actually use it with one of our in dummy devices. It's called a slice uh, six distributor that will communicate with it and also log the log the angles as the uh, as the system is being armed, and this is ready almost today. We have a uh, velocity measurement systems that we've built in the past, so we have several different several different varieties that were built. A little bit less of a, a crash worthy thing, but. If you needed it on the vehicle, I, I know we could build something that would be able to handle vehicle type loads. Um, dual laser light beams are utilized through a distance and also a timer clock to be able to monitor the, the speed. And it did have the ability to do miles per hour or kilometers per hour. It has its own built-in battery, so you're able to charge it up, roll it out, have a light or have a vein go through it and, uh, and report the report the speeds through serial communication or the digital display. And I'm gonna take some of you guys way, way back here. Um, High-speed camera control system. So DTS has been doing this now for 30 plus years. And if anybody remembers uh, older um, high-speed camera systems, you actually had to, you only had so many feet of film available um, and you wanted to make sure that they had the power available at a specific time to get up to speed so that when the event actually happened, you were able to collect the event before you ran out of film. And also preferably have some good timing marks because cameras were mechanical at that point in time. And you needed timing marks to see how fast they were actually spinning so that you could then try to synchronize camera to camera. So we had built one way, way back when that supported four different cameras and allowed you to have different run times and, and give you those timing marks that you needed. So the reason I show it is to basically, if, if you can think that you need it, there's a chance that we've probably developed it either recently or in the past, um, trying to expand your, your thought process a little bit. So that brings me to the end of our historical slash what is available today um, over overview of ruggedized accessories. What I'd like to do though is come back to the help center here and our preference is if you guys have a particular application that you're looking for some type of solution, um, utilize the help center. Go ahead, get yourself an account, put in a, a request for different items that you may need, or if you guys have some ideas of, uh, of things that may be coming down the road that maybe we haven't heard about yet, put in a request. We have 20 plus people throughout the world that monitor this help center and will basically, it allows us to 
monitor what the industry is looking for, what you're in particular looking for, and allows us to basically take that information and then go into our product development group and develop items that are going to help everybody in the long run. So please utilize the Help Center if you haven't done it already. So future requirements. Um, these are some of the things that are on, let's say, the, uh, the gray list at the moment. We're looking to do a revision to our TDAS um, mini distributor. Uh, the whole world basically is switching over to Rojas uh, type of devices. And some of our older devices, needless to say, are not Rojas compliant yet. Um, so in, as part of the transition over to Rojas, we try to make decisions whether it makes sense to keep using the same product line uh, and just do a, a new version of it, or if there's ways that we can improve the functionality, then we look at stuff like this. So one of the things that we've been asked about in the past is maybe something along the lines of a Slice Pro distributor or a distributor plus. Um, goals kind of are to be similar to similar footprint to a 72 channel Slice Pro system with a few different options. And I've got a couple, a couple of a uh, couple of slides I'd like to show here. So Distributor Plus would be for high, very high channel count um, vehicle type tests, whether it's aircraft or whether it's uh, land-based vehicle systems here. So on the right would be this um, Slice Distributor, Slice Pro Distributor Plus. This guy would actually utilize potentially two Power Pro batteries, depending on how much current you needed. And total, this test that I have laid out here is 820 analog channels. Um, easily fit in the back of any small, even small vehicle. Um, 16 airbag or Tom fire channels, trigger distribution, visual status, and, and also has multiple layers of power backup because the Power Pro has battery backup and also every single one of our Slice 6 type of dummies have power backup also. So this gives you a couple layers of protection for uh, high value assets testing. And then the regular Slice Pro distributor would be a system where maybe you didn't need the didn't need the Power Pro batteries, but instead you have offboard power potentially going to something like a, a high-speed sled or you have other battery devices or other power backup devices that are that are running. Um, basically the same type of channel count, 820, 16 Tom channels trigger distribution, visual status indicator, but there's only a single layer of backup power. Every Slice Pro unit has its own set of batteries and every Thor has its own set of batteries. So even if you did lose primary power, you still have one layer of protect protection. And then something else that we've been mulling over a little bit is uh, adding Slice 6 dummies to other types of systems. So for an example, if you had a, a system that had 48, vo 48 volt DC power, we typically run on 15 volt DC power. Um, if you had a system that happened to have like an RS-485 type of trigger uh, mechanism, uh, we've built devices like this in the past where we can convert from one type of trigger mechanism to another type of trigger mechanism, or make sure that status actually gets passed if the system is capable of, of performing status type of uh, functions or reading that type of status out of other, other areas. Um, we're thinking, we're considering doing something like this so that you can purchase a Slice 6, a Slice 6 distributor type of set up inside of a crash test dummy and plug it into other people's systems too. So with that, I am going to go ahead and switch over and take a look at the, uh, take a look at the questions and see what questions we've had there. Okay, great. There's a great question here. Do you have any, have you developed any telemetry interface systems? So we have, depending on the type of telemetry, I will, I will answer this in a slightly vague method, method but um, we actually have, we've been able to record GPS using Slice Nano, using Slice Micro, um, and then decoding the GPS signals. Other types of telemetry interface, we actually have a device called Slice 6 Air. Um, it wasn't really highlighted in this particular thing, and we've had other 
other um, webinars on Slice 6 Air, but Slice 6 Air actually does have a UART available inside of it to be able to communicate with other types of devices. But the particular type of telemetry, um, probably the best thing to do would be to put a ticket on our help system. If you're curious, customer or not, doesn't matter. Um, you can go ahead and put a ticket in the system and then we can get that back into the engineering group. But we can do, we can do 1588 type of timing with that Slice 6 Air product line. But there's a, there's a whole crew of engineers that can help out with that particular uh, question a little bit more. Um, a couple of other questions that were answered already. Can a CAN box interface with the Texas sensor and then into a rugged embedded computer? Um, I know that it's a logger. I know that it's a logger. I don't know about other interfacing. We'll have to take a look at that guy a little bit more. Um, how is a product rated as crash worthy? Great question. Um, we do, most of the time our devices are at, tested at at least, I think it's 50 Gs, three milliseconds. It might even be higher than that. Um, but we do sell devices that are rated at 5,000 Gs. Um, that's why we've got the one, the one shock machine that's able to, uh, when we sell you a 5,000 G shock rated device, every one of those gets tested on the particular machine to make sure that it is able to handle a minimum of 5,000 Gs. And uh, how many channels can a mini distributor support? The four system ports. Um, yep, each mannequin can have, right now we have mannequins out there that are 156 analog channels. And you're able to support at least 400 channels or so. Um, there's 200 watts available for power on the mini distributor. And every one of those dummies runs at uh, 60 some watts. So you can't quite put in four full dummies, but you can put in a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of channels. Um, Distance concerns associated with integration of high channel count systems and how many, and how is timing between the units assured? So depending on the type of device, um, basically we have devices that are capable of recording at least uh, 500 kilohertz, everything 500,000 samples per second. Um, some devices are actually able to go up to 1 million samples per second and all devices end up getting armed at the same time. Time zero gets marked at the same time. So there is overall clock accuracy. I would have to go back to my quality guys to get a, a really, really detailed answer on that. Um, but I'm sure we can get back with you on more detail. The Slice 6 Air, like Nate had actually mentioned, for those of you that can't read this, um, IEEE 1588, the uh, precision time protocol is actually a protocol that goes over ethernet and it allows all of the devices to be synchronized. Um, again, don't know the actual PPM um, as far as what's, uh, how that compares, but it, it is one of the better ways of, of synchronizing all of the devices. Actually, the fully digital data logger. Um, really like more information on that, on what in particular, what in particular we're looking for. So that would be great if we can get a, a, a help center ticket added on that guy. Um, two more open questions. So what is the highest shock rating DTS supports? We've actually developed, uh, we've actually developed some very it was called Slice HG, and I believe that was rated at 20,000 Gs. It was intended for um, very high speed, uh, very high speed things going through, let's just say brick, um, brick walls. So that was 20,000 Gs was a device that we had developed in the past. I believe that is the end of our, uh, that is the end of our, presentation. Appreciate everybody's time. I'd like to thank the panelists again for taking care of answering questions. Um, and 
like I said, if you guys don't mind, if there's some of those specific questions, if you wanna, or if there's items like the digital data logger system, I would love to get a help center ticket on that so that we can dig in a little bit deeper and make sure that we can uh, evaluate what we can do to support you guys in the future. All right, great, thanks, Chad. Uh, good presentation. I always learn something new when, uh, when you present, so I, I appreciate it. And thanks to everyone for participating. Uh, look for our next event uh, next month and uh, the continuation of this series. Uh, we'll at least do one webinar per month on a variety of, of different topics. So again, appreciate everyone's uh, attention this morning. And uh, thanks again, Chad. And uh, feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions, or as Chad mentioned multiple times, uh, hit up hit up our web uh, our help center and submit any uh, follow on questions. Okay, thank you again. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you.